shall not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. We thank God for the blessing that he gives to the readers, the hearers, and the believers of his holy word. You may be seated. Precious Father, I stretch my hands to thee, for there is no other help that I know, for if you were to withdraw yourself from me, Lord, there is no other place that I can go to receive what it is that I truly need. But Lord, I'm coming before you. I'm an empty vessel. You are a full fountain. And I need to be filled. I, I need to be filled with the power of your spirit. For I've come to understand that it's the empowering, it's the anointing of your spirit that enables us to break the yoke of bondage. Fill me even right now, dear Lord, and enable me to Preach your word with holy boldness and your God-given authority. And I pray, Father God, for that same anointing to fall upon those who are under the sound of my voice. I pray, Lord God, that in unity, in togetherness, we might receive your word with gladness. And I pray that it goes down into our innermost being and that it will come alive and come forth bearing fruit to your glory. Precious Father, I ask you to let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. You are my Lord, you are my strength, you are my rock, you are my redeemer. It's in the precious name of Jesus Christ that I pray and that all of God's people say, Amen. 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 From the portion of scripture that we read in the hearing, I just want to call your attention to verses 21 and 22. Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. When I was reading and meditating over this text of scripture and asking the Lord to give me a title. The thought came to my mind of Wilson Pickett mm. and a song that came out in 1966, and, and I guess that dates me a little bit. But we're all, there's some of us who remember that song. And the title of that song was 99 and a half 
just won't do. And in the lyrics of that song, he says, 99 and a half just won't do. It ain't going to get it. You have to have a hundred. Mm -hmm. And I just want to talk for just a few minutes from that subject. 99 and a half just won't do. And I want you to turn to the person sitting closest to you and say, neighbor, neighbor. or neighbor, or neighbor. You need a hundred. Amen, amen. You hear people saying that they almost did this. And they almost did that. They almost, but they didn't win the prize. He almost made it to the pros. They were almost able to work out their differences at the round table. Well, I just want to say today that if you are running a race, you can be leading all the way, and you almost don't cross the finish line, it won't do you a bit of good. And as a matter of fact, we can't even count you as thing in the race because you never finish. Almost won't get it. See, there have been many who have come close, but they didn't finish. There have been times that I have gone fishing and I have booked a big fish, but I didn't land it in the boat, nor did I bring it to shore. So I could say I almost caught that big fish. But the fact of the matter is that I didn't. See, almost just won't get it. Almost signifies coming up short. Almost means that you didn't get there. Almost means not quite. And I just want to say today, church, that almost is a depressing word in our lexicon. The word almost means near or close to. Almost means the opposite of right on. It means the opposite of precise. It means the opposite of on the money. It means the opposite of correct. See, what I'm trying to get across to you is almost won't get it. The word almost points to missed opportunities and wrong choices. I don't know about you, but I would rather be an almost loser than an almost winner. Think about it. Last Wednesday, Furman's basketball team, number 13 seed, almost lost to Virginia. A number four seed, Virginia almost won. But at the end of the game, Furman was the winner. It's bad to be an almost loser than to be an almost winner anytime. See, see, we have all heard some sad statements that have to do with almost. Almost statements like the one that we read this morning in our scripture reading that dealt with uh, the great Apostle Paul giving his testimony to the governor Festus and uh, King Agrippa. And after Paul had ended giving his uh, testimony before Festus and King Agrippa in verse number 28, uh, number, verse number 28 in, verse number, in chapter 26, uh, the governor Festus said, Paul, 
you have lost your mind. So much learning has made you mad. And King Agrippa said to Paul in verse number 28, Paul, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. Almost, almost won't get it. 99 and a half just won't do. You need 100. Well, the portion of scripture that we are considering this afternoon deals with a young man who found himself in an almost situation. A young man who found himself in a 99 and a half situation. And some of you might know someone like him and there might even be someone sitting in this church house today who might be like him. This young man had a great opportunity in front of him and he let it get away. It was there, it, it, was, it was right there in front of him and he almost took advantage of it. He was so close but he let the opportunity get away. The scripture text refers to him as the rich young ruler. And when it comes to the reality of him being one of Jesus' disciples, we can say that he almost yeah. made it. He was a rising star in the community and probably full of promise. But he walked away from an opportunity to work with Jesus. And when, when, when you, you look at this young man, we can see that he had great potential. He could have been a mighty person in the ministry of the Lord. He might have won a lot of other powerful and influential people in the community to Jesus. The scripture tells us that one day he, he met Jesus and, and he wavered on the edge of commitment. He thought about the Lord's response to his question and, and he pondered on the idea of it and he almost took Jesus as the Lord of his life. But almost won't get it because 99 and a half just won't do. You need a hundred. Now this story, the story of the rich young ruler is found in three of the four gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We call them the synoptic gospels. And we find it here in Matthew 19, and we find it in Mark chapter 10, and also in Luke chapter 18. And as we study their individual stories, we, we find that each description of the event is a little different. As it should be, because when somebody sees something or someone tells a story, if it was all told the same way, there'd have to be something wrong with it. Because when I see something and you see something and someone else sees something, we see different things and, and we express different things. So we find that the description in Matthew, Mark, and Luke are a little different. But they tend to tie together the three things into one combined and collective story or narrative. When you compare scripture with scripture, we find that all three tell us that the young man was rich, that he was well to do, that he had lots of money and great possessions. Matthew tells us that he was young. In verse number 20 of chapter 19, 
Luke 18, 18 tells us that he was a ruler. And Mark 10, 17 tells us that the man ran up to Jesus and knelt before him, indicating that he was sincere and that he had reverence and respect for Jesus. Matthew 19, 16 says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing yes. shall I do that I may have eternal life? Having eternal life in the Greek language means having a life of satisfaction. Having a life of real joy. Having a life of peace with God. And everybody ought to want that kind of life. Amen? Everybody ought to want eternal life. See, because eternal life is what you get in your life when you have Jesus in your life. I'm talking about things that the world can't give you and that the world can't take away. This rich young ruler seemed to have everything in the world that he needed. He had money, he had influence, he had prestige, he had a lot going for him, but there was something that was missing in his life. Something was missing. He, he had everything except what he really wanted. He had everything except what he really needed. And his desire was to have and possess and to be possessed by eternal life. His desire was to have and to hold and, and to be held by abundant life that can only be found in Jesus. And when you look at the text, we see that he came to the right source in order to obtain what it was that he wanted. He came to the right source in, in order to get what he needed. Hallelujah. Because he came to Jesus. Yes. That's how. But he missed it. Because 99 and a half just won't do. Why not, church? Because you need. A hundred. You know, there are some churches where folks who attend are looked down upon if they say hallelujah. They're looked down upon if they say praise the Lord. And sometimes uh, Baptist churches have a tough time with that also. But not here at Union. Am I right about it, Union? Can I get a hallelujah? Can I get a praise to the Lord? Can I get a thank you, Jesus? Hallelujah. We don't mind praising the Lord. There are a whole lot of folk in our churches who have never felt the joy and the rejoicing in their souls because they know Jesus Christ as their Savior. They are almost Christians. But almost won't get it. 99 and a half just won't do. You need a hundred. The rich young ruler came to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with what I believe is one of life's most important questions. What good things shall I do that I may have eternal life. Or as the Philippian jailer asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? Well. Those are important questions. What good thing, Lord, must I do in order to receive eternal life? What must I do to be saved? Mm. First of all, let me say this, that there is no good thing that any of us can do to be saved. There is not anything that we can do in and of ourselves. 
ourselves to gain eternal life, but believe on the one who is eternal life. And I'm talking about Jesus. See, it's not about the works of righteousness which we have done or the works of righteousness that we can do, but according to his mercy and his grace, hallelujah, he saves us. Yes, and secondly, let me see this. Hmm. You can have all the answers to all the questions you might have in your life. But if you don't know the answer to this important question, your life will amount to nothing because you will still be lost and on your way to hell because you almost. You can sing in the choir and you almost. You can stand at the door and you can usher and you almost. You can serve as a deacon or a trustee and you almost. You can preach the word of God and you almost. You can hold many positions in the church and, and you almost, but, but you didn't and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I'm here to tell you once again, almost won't get it. Won't get it. Almost is a sad and sorrowful word. Almost won't get it. 99 and a half just won't do. You need a hundred. Mm -hmm. See, what folks don't understand is that Christianity is not a religion. See, religion is all about rules and regulations and rituals. Christianity is about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes. And there are many people who have grown up in the church and they assume that being a Christian means attending church. But it's not a personal relationship with Jesus. That is a personal relationship that you have with the church. You have a personal relationship with the church. You have a personal relationship with the people, not with Jesus. All right. They are in the same place yes. that the rich young ruler was in his life at the crossroads of almost and complete. Mm. Almost and a hundred. For that man, hallelujah, when he ran up to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It was time for him to make a decision. Mm. And when it comes to Jesus, and him being Lord and Savior of your life, there is no middle ground. He either is or he ain't. Excuse my English. But look at verse number 21. Jesus makes a diagnosis. And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, Go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. He makes a decision. He makes a diagnosis. He writes out a prescription. And he gives the prognosis. Jesus looked deep down in the innermost portals of the young man's life. He saw the signs of treasure and prosperity were all over this rich young man. He saw that his soul was in the bank. And his mind was on Wall Street. Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all that you have and give 
to the poor. Yes. And when you do that, you will have treasure in heaven. Mm. And come and follow me. The diagnosis was, young man, you're not ready yet. There's something in your life that's blocking your way. You're almost ready, but not quite. But I gotta write you a prescription. And Dr. Jesus says, if you will be perfect, if you will be complete, you need to go and sell all that you have. You need to give it up and turn it loose yes. and give it to the poor. Yes. And here's my prognosis. You'll be better off. You will be ready. You will be complete. In other words, he was saying, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all those other things will be added unto you. And come and follow me for where your treasure is, I'll be there. Your treasure will be in heaven because heaven is where I'm from and heaven is where I'm going. You just come on and follow me. Yes, amen. Yes, amen. What the Lord was really saying to the rich young ruler was this. And he might be talking to somebody who's sitting here and hearing this right now, today. You are carrying a security blanket that you are relying on more than you rely on God. And God told me to tell you that he will not allow himself uh, to be second fiddle in your life's uh, orchestra. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? He will not allow himself to be second fiddle in your life's orchestra. That false sense of security got to be taken off the throne if you're going to experience the glory of God. It's all or it's nothing. 99 and a half just won't do. Look at verse number 22. And I find that this is one of the most sorrowful verses in Scripture. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This young man had been so close to a wonderful and glorified God. Having the opportunity to have his life centered with Jesus. There was something that he had seen in Jesus. There, 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 there was something in Jesus that, that caused him to, to, to be excited and, and to go running to him and to kneel down before him and ask that question, what good thing must I do in order to gain eternal life? But he just couldn't let go of his own false security. His whole life had been a preparation for a place in the crossroads of his life. Mm -hmm. But the price was too high. His money had always been his source of calmness, his, his source of certainty, his, his source of comfort and confidence, and it was just too hard for him to break loose. There was no way that he could live without his false security. So he went away sorry. You know, the greatest regret of all, and Sister Thomas said it this morning, Psalmson said it this morning, the greatest regret of all will be for those who stand 
before Jesus and hear him say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you because you let almost stand in your way. And as I close, let me say this. Jesus didn't ask that rich young ruler to do any more than he was willing to do. Because Jesus left the glories of heaven and all the riches of heaven. And he stepped down through 40 and two generations, was born through the womb of Mary the Virgin. He took on the flesh of man. You don't hear what I'm saying. I'm trying to tell you that Jesus could tell that rich young ruler what was needed because he was willing to do it for him and he was willing to do the same for us. Jesus, I'm talking about, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But they tell me that he made himself of no reputation, that he took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of sinful man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He knew almost wouldn't get it. He understood that 99 and a half just won't do that you need a hundred. He knew it when he prayed in the garden. He knew it when Judas kissed him on the cheek. He knew it when the soldiers took him away. He knew it when he stood before the Jewish leaders. He knew it when he stood before Pilate and Herod. He knew it when they beat him within an inch of his life. He knew it when they carried the old rugged cross through the streets of Jerusalem and up Mount Calvary's hill. He knew it when they nailed him to the cross. He knew it when he died on the cross. He knew it when they took him off the cross. He knew it when they put him in the tomb. He knew that 99 and a half just won't do. You got to have a hundred. We needed a hundred. We needed a hundred percent of the obedience of Jesus unto death. So he stayed in the tomb three whole days, three whole nights. But hallelujah, Sunday came. Mission was accomplished. Mission was complete. To send that pain, he got up from the grave yes. with all power. Yes. All power. Because he understood mm -hmm. almost won't get it. 99 and a half. Just wouldn't do because you and I needed a hundred. Can you say with me, Jesus gave it all. Jesus gave he didn't hold nothing back. He finished the work. And my Bible says, wherefore, hallelujah, God has highly exalted him and given him a name, hallelujah, that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 99 and a half. Just won't do it. You need a hundred. Let us pray, Father. We thank you so much. Jesus could have stopped at any point in his journey from heaven to the cross, to the tomb. He could have stopped anywhere, but he didn't. He understood that it was all or nothing. Jesus. 
at 99 and a half just wouldn't do. That we who are born in sin and shaped in iniquity needed for him to give us a hundred. And that's what he did. We thank you so much. We know, Lord God, that you send out your word and it does not return unto the void. But it accomplishes the purpose for which you have sent it and it performs in the place that you have sent it. You sent your word into our hearts and we know from God that it will do its work. And we just say thank you. It's in the precious name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.